Hello, everybody. Welcome to day four of Let's Talk About IT. Uh, if this is your first day joining, uh, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Uh, and if you're wondering that you've missed the previous uh, days, the previous presentations, don't worry. Uh, they're all recorded. You can find them on Yonder's YouTube channel. Uh, if you're joining from the previous days as well, welcome back. Uh, today, my name is Alex, by the way. Today, we'll be talking about uh, supercharged web applications. And especially, we'll be taking a look at Capacitor uh, for deploying our freshly converted mobile app into, into stores. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's first start with some, some introductions. Um, this is me. Hey, you can see me on the screen. You can see me on, on the view as well. Uh, I'm Alex, as I mentioned it. Uh, I am a product developer for the past six and a half years. Uh, I've been working with Yonder. Um, I'm a huge fan of video games. So every time I find some spare time, uh, I try to just play some video games. I'm, I'm a competitive nature and I really like to just go in some video games and, uh, and compete with, uh, with other players online. Uh, and I'm a big fan of music. Ever since I was in high school, I've been trying to practice the guitar. Uh, I'm not a professional. I just do it in my spare time. And from time to time, I just take out my guitar and pluck some strings. All right, going further. Uh, let's look at some statistics. Uh, we all like statistics, we know about that. Uh, this is a graph that I've taken from the Web Almanac from 2022. The Web Almanac is a collection of uh, reports uh, made uh, over analyzing around 6 billion applications. is top 1,000 apps, the next column, the next 10,000 apps, and so on. Uh, the mobile traffic is higher by 88% than desktop applications in, in 2022. And it's an increase from around 78. So that's a huge increase. And you can see that for the next categories as well, for the next the popularities, the trend is in favor of, uh, of uh, uh, the mobile traffic as well, and it's increasing. So you can just make sure that the having mobile applications is just a trend and people use them, use their mobile devices to, to uh, access application. So that's something to take in consideration. Um, going further, another graph, uh, you can see the uh, evolution of the market share from December 2021 till December 2022, so a year, a year of uh, time span. Uh, you can see here that the market share has increased around 4% on, uh, on mobile. So in 2021, it's like a 56 uh, market share, 56% market share. And in 2022, it's a 60% market share. So that's an increase. While the desktop market share is, uh, is, has fallen a little bit from 42 to 37. And the tablet market share is just flat. So again, the trend is in favor of mobiles. <laughs> and a really cool study that has been made in uh, in April 2020 by eMarketer uh, shows that an average uh, user spends around three hours on, on their mobile phones uh, browsing through apps, <clears throat> uh, as opposed to browsing through, through their browser, actually. It's like 25 minutes, 24 minutes. And they have uh, estimated that in 2021 and 2022 that, uh, that uh, uh, time will increase on mobile devices. They didn't come up with a follow-up, so not sure exactly if this is true, but either way, either way you can see the, the increase in, uh, in usage. All right, let's think about the following scenario. Uh, you have already a web application deployed in production, and you have uh, a lot of end users. They're happy users. We'll consider them all happy. Um, and that's really nice. Uh, but you also want to have access to, to a different market, to the mobile market. And having access to the mobile market and having access to different two different platforms, iOS and Android respectively, uh, it will pretty much increase your uh, reach for end users. And in the end, you will have more happy users. So this is the, uh, the case study that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today. 
Uh, there are a lot of ways in which you can have a web application turn into a mobile application, but today we'll be taking a look especially at Capacitor and what can Capacitor do for you uh, in order to convert your app. All right. So what exactly is Capacitor? By definition, Capacitor is a cross-platform native runtime for web applications. So what this exactly means is uh, you can have access to multiple platforms with one single code base, and it's just native runtime. So the code base exists, it existed before, and what Capacitor does is just having this runtime for you to have uh, cross-platform uh, support. To look further in detail for this, you can think about Capacitor as some sort of bridge, uh, and you have your code base, your, your web application, which is uh, JavaScript-based. Uh, it can be any kind of flavor. You can have Angular, you can have React, you can have Svelte, you can have even jQuery. That's all right. As long as it has uh, JavaScript at its core, uh, your application is here. And as I mentioned, Capacitor as a bridge, you feed, you feed your, your app through this bridge, and it spits out uh, native apps for different platforms, like a native Android app, and a native iOS app, and a PWA if uh, that's also what you, you want to achieve, a progressive web app. So with one code base, you can have three different apps. That's pretty cool. Um, this isn't new. So Capacitor it, it, it does not have a new state-of-the-art tech that has never, before, has never seen before. Um, it's built over Cordova. Cordova has been in the market for a lot of time now. And it had its advantages. It has its advantages, but it also had a lot of flaws. So what the uh, Driftico team, basically the team behind Ionic, what they did was try, they, they tried to build on top of it and correct basically the most major flaws. So instead of using um, the web view and having the uh, web APIs used uh, in that mobile application, what Capacitor tries to do is they made bridges uh, to have access to native APIs. So your app can make use of native APIs seamlessly and at its fullest. So that's pretty cool. Since it's built on uh, um, Cordova, that means it's, it's basically backwards compatible. So you can use plugins from Capacitor, like the camera, like the file system, like the keyboard, but you can also use plugins from Cordova since it works, it's made on top of Cordova. So you can have the battery status, you can have the screen orientation plugin or a geolocation if that's uh, that's what you, you're looking for. So basically your app can work with these utilities from both technologies. All right, uh, this, this is not a uh, how to build a mobile application for easy steps. Um, we're not gonna have this, this, this talk today, but um, I'll be showing you four key steps to convert the web application into a mobile app using Capacitor. So let's just dive into it. Uh, step zero, we're programmers, right? We start from zero. Uh, requirements, what do you actually need before uh, thinking about uh, using, Cordova, using Capacitor, sorry. First of all, you would need uh, your applications to, to run on Node.js uh, versions 14 higher. That's the minimum requirement. It needs to have a package JSON in, in the source files. Uh, it needs to have a dedicated build folder for the output of the web app, like a slash dist or a slash www. These are the most common uh, folders for this. And it needs an index, index HTML, which is going to be the entry point for your web app, in which capacitor is going to be injected and everything is going to work just as expected. Uh, for uh, developing on iOS, for having an iOS app, you would need a Mac or you will need Mac OS, basically, a Mac OS machine that can have access to, to Xcode and installing Xcode command line tools to, to work on the build. And also CocoaPods in order to manage uh, all the needed plugins uh, for, your, for, for your app and packages as well. On Android, on the other hand, you will need the IDE like you would need for iOS Xcode. In here, you would need Android Studio, and you would need to have an Android SDK installed um, in order to, to develop your app. These are the minimum requirements. All right, now going actually into how to do this. Uh, first things first, you need to configure Capacitor. Uh, how, in order to configure Capacitor, you would have to install the package from NPM. So installing Capacitor Core and installing the CLI. In this situation, 
I uh, I added here the the development uh, dependency to CLI because we don't need this in the final uh, final builds. So it's just a de de developer dependencies. Then after you install these uh, these two uh, packages, you will have to initiate the capacitor um, uh, tool. When you do this, first of all, it will ask uh, what would you want to be the name of your application and what should the package ID be for your application. In this scenario, I used Colossum app and the ID would be com.colossum.app. It's something that it's identifiable for, uh, for your app. After you do that, you would uh, have generated using this command, it would generate you this, uh, this uh, configuration uh, uh, file called capacitor.config.ts in which everything that you added there will be added here. And in the future, you can also tweak and uh, add different configurations that you, you find necessary using the capacitor documentation. Cool. Now, in order to have access to Android and iOS, because this is what we care about, we'll have to install the packages for Android and for iOS, like following, and add them into our project by using MPX cap add the respective platforms. When you do add Android and add iOS, what Capacitor does is it generates the boilerplate code, actually native code for Android and for iOS. So you would have any, the boilerplate code for uh, bootstrapping and building uh, these native apps. Cool. Now, a um, generic workflow in, in which you can use Capacitor for. So you want to, let's say, add new functionalities after you configured, you install Capacitor, you want to add new functionalities on your web app. You do that using, uh, you, I don't know, you, you add stuff, and then you would have to synchronize uh, the JavaScript code into the native uh, runtimes by using MPX cap sync. So this is needed every time you, you modify the, uh, the JavaScript source code. Then if you want to uh, test uh, your apps on either emulators or on your actual devices, you can just plug in your phone into your laptop and just run MPX cap, run iOS and run Android. This runs your app on, uh, on these um, uh, platforms. And if you want to open your IDE, for example, from the command line tools, you can just use MPX cap open iOS or Android. It will open either Xcode or Android Studio, depending on what you want to do. Cool. Now that we configure capacitor, step two is to translate our app and to make it more uh, user-friendly for mobile devices. Uh, this step is optional if your app already has responsive design, but in a situation where your app is made only for large screen and it doesn't support uh, small mobile screens, this is, this is mandatory. Cool. So as a case study, let's think about this application. It's a traveling app. Uh, you, you, can plan, you can plan uh, travel uh, itineraries in here. Uh, on the left side, you would have the design for this app on large screens. And on the right side is how uh, a new UX designer has visioned this same application into a smaller mobile friendly uh, version. So this is what we have to do with, with uh, our applications as well before actually deploying them into, into, uh, into the stores. Um, the process for this requires a lot of um, doodling and scribbling and uh, trying to see exactly how components fit into a smaller screen. You have to rearrange the layout. You have to uh, resize the components, make them smaller and usable. And it requires a lot of uh, trial and error and just uh, drawing stuff. Go back to the drawing board. Uh, but on a more technical level, uh, the most common approach and I think the easiest approach would be just using CSS. So. Everything is just CSS in here. You don't really have to mess with the logic of the application. You just have to mess with the styling of the application so you can make it responsive. Um, in the end, it just boils down to media queries. So you could use media queries to make uh, breakpoints for different screens. Uh, in this example, you have like a 
width of 1024, which is like a, a small laptop, uh, 768, which is like a, a tablet, and a 375, which is like a medium phone, mobile phone. And using these breakpoints, you can make different styles and just rearrange components or make them bigger or smaller, resize them, or anything that works for, for smaller screens. And the, um, the app will just pull these style sheets for these uh, breakpoints and just render everything friendly. This is mandatory if it's not made already. But as I mentioned, if it's uh, if your app already supports responsive design, you can just skip the step. All right. Now, to make most of the uh, mobile phone, uh, we will have to use native APIs. Um, again, this is not a mandatory step. Uh, it's just highly recommended. You can just make use of web APIs, and just it will work just fine, but not as performant as it would using native APIs. So what's a native API? Um, this is the phone. This is an icon of the phone. Uh, the phone has uh, is made out of a lot of small uh, and useful and powerful hardware pieces. Uh, for example, it has like um, either one or a set of different lenses, which can be accessed using the camera API. Uh, it has a, a small GPS sensor that can be used using the geolocation API. It has like uh, a storage uh, hardware, like a small SSD or a flash memory, which can be used by the file system API. It has like a small uh, motorized sensors that can be used uh, when you type in the keyboard and when you have different vibration uh, through your application, and they can be accessed by the haptics API. These are like small examples. Um, it has a lot of APIs. Uh, you can find them in uh, in the capacitor documentation. It's highly recommended to check those out. And let's look at, at an example on how to actually translate something that you have used using uh, developed using. Uh, web APIs into having native APIs. And we'll take a small example, like really simple example of uh, geolocation. Uh, if you want to, to check the current coordinates for uh, on your application for users, you would have to use the geolocation um, API from the navigator, um, which, which is a web API. You would get the current position, you would get the coordinates, and you can do anything that you want with the coordinates. Now. Uh, if you want to translate this using native APIs, first things first, you would have to install the plugin for the geolocation. So it's npm install capacitor geolocation. And as I mentioned in the workflow, you would have to sync. Uh, every time you do a modification, you have to sync uh, this um, uh, the, the code base. Then having, this is a translation of kind of a, the same exact code. You would have to import the, the plugin that you just installed. And in order to access it, you would have to use get current position from that uh, plugin instead of using the web API. It's a promise. It returns a promise. So you, it's a synchronous. You can use a sync await, or you can just use then if you want to, like you would on the, uh, on the navigator's side. And after you get the coordinates, you can do anything that you want with them. So it's pretty similar. You just have to use the, the functions from a different place. All right, uh, this is not everything that you have to do though. Um, so basically every time you want to use a, an API from your phone, uh, you would have to ask for permission from a user. And in order to set these, uh, these permissions, uh, on iOS, what you would do, you would go to the app, you go to the uh, app on the targets, and on the info tab, you would add here uh, the key and the values for, uh, for the geolocation uh, permission. Uh, basically, the value should be a string, and the value should be what the user would see when they get prompted with a dialog that, hey, do you want to allow uh, the geolocation to be used by your app? Um, another place when you can uh, change this is if you don't want to go through the Xcode, if you don't want to go to the IDE, you can just go through the um, uh, into iOS app app info.plist. In there, it's an XML, and you can add the key and uh, the string, which is uh, the value basically, uh, which is the same thing as before, but a bit more technical, let's say, and not as uh, interactive. Uh, for this exact um, use case, like the geolocation, uh, iOS asks for these two keys, like the NS location always user description and the NS location when in use user description. Uh, you add these, as I mentioned before, and the values should be, again, what the user would see on screen. On Android, 
it's pretty similar. It's the same thing. You still have to ask for permission. You still have to to uh, to use this. It's just a different place. It's still an XML like it is the info plist. You would have to go to Android Manifest XML this time. There's no interactable thing in, in the IDE as it is on Xcode, but you have to go directly into the uh, into the source code and write in here. Uh, in the XML, uh, under the manifest tag anywhere, but uh, basically what capacitor does when it generates the code, it's at the end of the manifest, uh, but not necessarily necessary there. Uh, you would need to add two different permissions, usage, usage permission for access course location and uses permission for access find location. Uh, and another thing that you have to add here that's uh, not needed on the iOS version, uh, you would have to use the uses feature tag in which you tell the app uh, that it uses GPS as hardware. You can find all this information on the documentation. This, is, this was just like a really small example, but if you want to use other APIs on the file system or the camera, you can just check what do you have to add in where for, for app to work uh, properly. All right, now, if you are to compare the both, uh, it's not that big of a difference. It, it is the same process. It is the same requirement. Uh, it's just that you have to go in different other places. And the iOS has an alternative. You I can either go into the uh, IDE or you can just go into the uh, source code. All right. Now, the last step before uh, having your app used by a lot of users is to make it live. Just, just go live. Uh, this step is basically the same step that you would use for a native app that you would develop using uh, Kotlin or Java using for Android or uh, Swift and Objective-C for um, uh, iOS. So it's the same process, uh, but just the build is, uh, is different because it has JavaScript. Now, if you are to take a glance at the store, um, first things first, the final bundle, the final build for, for both platforms. Um, on iOS, you would have a, an IPA file, and on Android, you would have an APK file. Uh, the stores, there's App Store for, for Apple and there's Google Play Store for, for Android. Uh, you wouldn't need a uh, developer account in order to, to deploy uh, your app into the stores. In order to have a functional developer account, you would have to pay a fee of $100, which is annual for, for iOS, and a one-time fee of $25 for, for Android. And you would have to comply to some guidelines uh, established by, uh, by both companies. Uh, and after you, you submit your app into the stores, it has to be reviewed that these guidelines are respected. And it should take around 24 hours to 48 hours on average. Um, this can take less. This can take longer. It all depends on uh, how um, how well do you respect the guidelines that uh, that they have set? But on average, it's just like a one to two days. All right. Now let's go. Uh, let's go into into the how to do it part. Uh, buckle up because this is going to be uh, a lot of steps presented. Um, let's start with iOS. So first things first. You would go to App Store Connect. You would create your app in here. You just add the name. What platforms are is the app on? Uh, primary language and stuff like that, you, you hit create. And then in here, you would have the dashboard basically for, for the set that you just created. Um, in the dashboard, you can add screenshots for, for your app that will be seen by users when they go into App Store. You can add like different uh, metadata or like different descriptions, different information that will appear on the store. Uh, after this is created, the page, you would have to go into the IDE. Uh, you would need to add the capabilities uh, for your app. If your app uses uh, Apple uh, services, like, I don't know, Wallet or Siri or anything that Apple uses. So this would be have to be added in capability. Um, and on the signing part, you would have to add your team in here. And it should be filled in automatically if your team is configured correctly. Uh, then you would uh, build your app and archive the app. Um, if you don't have a specific iOS version in mind or a specific iOS device in mind, you can just go for any iOS device as mentioned here. And you archive it. 
then after you archive it, you get prompted with a dialogue of what do you want to do with this archive? Where do you want to distribute it? Um, the easiest method is to use App Store Connect that you, you just configure your app in App Store Connect. Uh, you would upload. Uh, you would uh, have to, I don't know, uh, it asks if you want to uh, upload your app symbols or manage the version and the bill number. These are recommended to be set on on uh, on checked because it's easier for app symbols to have uh, debugging later on uh, and analytics. And managing the version of the bill number, it's just a nice convenience to be managed automatically. And in here, uh, it is recommended to use automatically managed signing if 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 it works, <laughs> and hopefully it works, because uh, if you want to go for manually managing signing, then uh, we can have like a different talk about this, uh, which will take like a lot of time. So uh, recommended to have one automatically and hope that it works. Uh, you would have been presented with all the certificates that your team has, you upload, and if all the planets align, your app should be successfully uploaded to, uh, to App Store, uh, sorry, to App Store Connect. Cool. And then you check it, you check on App Store Connect, you see that your build has been added in here on in test flight exactly. Uh, you can test it in here, you can run it and see if, if your build has been added successfully. Uh, you would scroll down basically a lot. And on the build uh, category, you would have to select the build before you submit your app. You would have to select your actual build. And after that, you just submit for review. Um, after 24 to 48 hours, as mentioned earlier, you should be uh, you should ha be having your app in in the App Store if uh, everything is conforming to their um, guidelines. So cool, celebrate! That's that's awesome. Now for Android, it's a similar uh, route. You, you would have to go to Google Play Console this time, uh, register, uh, sign in with your developer account, create uh, a new app in here. Uh, add in the necessary details like the name, like the full language, what kind of app it is. It is like an app or a game. If it's free or paid, you would fill in that form. And then you would go to the IDE, to Android Studio, and you would want to generate a signed bundle or APK. Uh, we would have to go to, for the signed bundle. Um, if you don't have a key store path, basically the key store path is a, the uh, key store that holds certificates, you would have to create a new key store path. And in here, uh, you would add for the certificate like uh, all the necessary information for uh, your company, like who is the owner for the um, for the certificate, uh, organization that is part of, it, and so on. And very important is you would have to add a password that you will need to to remember and keep it safe because if you want to modify these details in the future, you will need this password to to do so. Right after you create the uh, key store. You would go, you would click next basically on the previous screen, and you would have to click on release because we want to have like a, a production level build, so release. And you would uh, be generated a, a bundle. You take that bundle, uh, you copy it, uh, you would go to back to the Google Play Console, and scrolling a bit down to your, your new app, your new shiny app has been created. You would go to production, and from there, click on the create new release here. And in here, you have the uh, the bundle side. You just paste the bundle that you've just generated in here. And also in here, you can uh, add screenshots and necessary details for uh, for the user to see when they go on Google Play Store and um, check your, uh, your app. Right, after you upload, um, basically, it takes around 24 to 48 hours again to, to review your app by uh, by Google. And if everything is all right, if you've respected their guidelines, congrats, you have now have two apps on uh, on two different platforms. All right, uh, this has been long. Uh, I hope it wasn't overwhelming. Uh, as a summary, as a recap, this is basically the steps that you have to do. They're very similar. It just needs to have different places that you, you would go and you would have to, to do. But overall, it's very similar. Cool. Uh, now, I've showed you the manual side of things. You can also automate a lot of these steps for different versions, for different releases, for different uh, um, maybe A-B testing and stuff like that. Um, you can use uh, platforms to automate this. If you are using the Microsoft Suite, you can use uh, Microsoft App Center. To, to do this automatically. Uh, you can use AppFlow, which is uh, 
some sort of CI/CD and uh, distribution platform uh, made by Ionic for the Ionic team. Um, these two are paid, so you would need to have um, an enterprise solution, and they're paid. You can, you would have to pay for these basically. Uh, there's also a, a free solution. It's called Fastlane. Um, it does kind of the same things, but it's a bit more rudimentary. It's a bit more. Uh, it's stripped of a lot of functionalities that uh, App Center and AppFlow has, but it does the job. So if you want to have like something really fast, free, Fastlane is also a good solution for you. Great. Now that we've been through this journey together, um, let's have a small recap. Um, what are the steps? Again, step one, computer capacitor. Step two, responsive design. Step three, using the native APIs, and finally, last but not least, deploying stuff and going live. All right. Um, now, what's my opinion on uh, Capacitor? Uh, do I recommend Capacitor for, uh, for uh, having mobile application? Well, context really matters. It's all about uh, the context of your app, uh, what languages does it support, uh, if you have, a lot of JavaScript developers in your team and they can just do something really fast. If you don't really care about having special functionalities that's only specific for mobile and you just want the app in the stores, sure, that's that's cool. Um, if you want to cut costs and don't want to have like two different, three different actually, because you have the web app and then you might have, if you want a native, you might want to have iOS developers and Android developers. Um, three different code bases, three different teams, so having only one with capacitor, it cuts a lot of costs and it cuts a lot of the time needed for development. So that's a big advantage. Um, it's cool that it works with any kind of JavaScript flavor. So it's not limited only to Angular and React, which are the the big two and in, uh, in the industry. You can use Vue, you can use Svelte, which has been uh, catching up a lot of steam recently. So. Anything works as long as it has a package JSON and an index file and anything that I mentioned in the in the requirements, that's awesome. Um, I would recommend using Capacitor for apps that are basic or medium in the complex team. So if your app uses a lot of image processing or maybe machine learning, or maybe it uses extensively a lot of the sensors. It wants to use a lot of the sensors that the mobile uh, devices have. Maybe capacitor is not necessarily the, the right way to, to, to go. But if it's basic to medium, it it's awesome. It can be used really easily, configured easily, and deployed easily. Now, a plus that's it's it's in here as well. Although I have never uh, um, I never used the enterprise support, but they have enterprise support. So if you want to have access to to their uh, support team, if you want to um, suggest a lot of functionalities to add, if you want to basically to have enterprise um, support for your app, you can you can pay for this for this. Uh, your team can pay for this. Now the downsides, because basically capacitor is not the um, it's not a technology sent uh, from God to to us. It has a lot of downsides as well. Um, one big downside that uh, it's really inconvenient is the final bundle. So the app, the APK or the IPA that's generated in the end is going to be really big. Um, this is in comparison with native apps and of course with Cordova apps because it's built over Cordova, it should have some comparison in place. Um, on average, uh, a build that should take like 10 megabytes for made from Cordova, uh, in capacitor it takes around 100 megabytes. Um, this happens because as I mentioned, capacitor tried to to have access to native hardware and native APIs instead of the browser APIs. And by doing this, they have added a lot of overheads in wrappers and bridges and in plugins that they uh, they need to in order to have access to, to these uh, hardware stuff. So this is the downside, the big one, it's really big. Your app is going to be huge. Um, overall, it's not the best performance. This is why I mentioned basic to medium complexity. Uh, it's it's a hybrid app. 
it's still a hybrid app. It has a web view. And even though it's headless, you don't have access to navigation in the web view, it's still a web view, it's still a browser. It's a browser a browser rendered in uh, in your uh, in your app, and it runs through that browser. So overall, the performance is not not the best. And the plugin uh, availability for for capacitor is is rather limited in comparison to Cordova. Um, this this comes because Cordova is a community uh, backed, community maintained uh, technology. And it's open source. The community has made a lot of plugins available for everybody to use. Um, Capacitor is is not open source. It's not made uh, by the community. It's made by Drifico, uh, the company behind Ionic. Uh, they made available a lot of the, the plugins that are the most important, let's say, um, to have access to, to native APIs. But not as many as you would have on Cordova. So if you want to have something really custom, something, I don't know, um, something that's a bit more unorthodox, you will still have to go to, to Cordova and uh, access the Cordova plugins in order to, uh, to achieve what you want. So this is a downside as well. Overall, capacitor, good if you want to cut costs and that's pretty cool. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being with me. Uh, I will now take uh, questions if they have been uh, added in here. Uh, we will have like a, a 10 minute Q&A session. So we have time for, uh, for the next webinar as well. Thank you very much. Okay. No questions yet. All right. Um, Razvan asked me if, can I develop applications with offline support in Capacitor? Uh, thank you, Razvan. That's a really good, uh, good question. Um, of course you can. Um, Capacitor makes use of, um, the offline support that, that it's available for uh, native apps as well. Uh, you can also go for the web way of doing using service workers. So that's an option as well. It's just, it's possible. It's up to you which one you want to use. Uh, all right, Catalin asks me, uh, okay, I already have a hybrid app, but it was built with Cordova. Do I migrate? Um, this depends. Uh, Cordova is, is an old technology indeed. It's, it's mature, it's, it's pretty old. Um, the fact that it's community-based uh, is also an advantage uh, because it's, it's still maintained. So it still has updates. There is no, uh, risk of dying out uh, in the near future, at least. Uh, it's true, it uses some deprecated uh, technologies or maybe not as efficient way of uh, using things with the uh, web APIs instead of the uh, native APIs. So pretty much it's not necessary to migrate. Uh, if you want to have higher performance uh, for your app, yes, go for it. You can migrate. Um, and it's pretty cool because it's backwards compatible. So if you want to uh, migrate step by step using uh, using Capacitor and having Cordova, you can just use the first step that I mentioned, uh, just configure Capacitor. Um, the responsive design parts should be in there <laughs> because you already have an app in Cordova. Um, and just go step by step. You can just go for migrating plugin by plugin until you are happy with the result. I hope that answered your question. Um, okay, Irina asks me, uh, do you know of popular apps that were made with Capacitor? Uh, yes, their, Capacitor has a, uh, a page um, in, their, in their blog, I think, in their website, uh, called Case Studies. Um, 
they have researched, they have analyzed apps, big apps that big companies that use use capacitor and how they did it. It's a nice read if you want to if you want to go for that. I think the most popular that I know so far are um, uh, the Disney app is made with capacitor, the BBC app is made with capacitor, and I think the Burger King app is made with capacitor. These are the big three names that I I can think of. Um, I can give you a, a link towards the case studies. Um, yeah, I'll say it at the end with the uh, with the final email to everybody. Uh, all right, Vlad asks me, when would you recommend the Ionic Enterprise license? That's a really good question, Vlad. Um, as I mentioned, I wasn't really uh, I didn't have the opportunity to to work with the uh, enterprise uh, option that they have. Um, I would assume that the best moment to do this is if you have like a really big product um, made uh, by a big number of development teams, and you would really depend on the support that the Ionic team has, and you would require custom implementations, or maybe you want to avoid having critical bugs in, in there and just push things if, uh, if needed. So I would say if your app is really big, if you have a lot of development teams, that would probably be a good moment to, to think about having the enterprise license. All right. Um, this is a question by uh, Anonymous attendee. Uh, so, hey, Anonymous, uh, is it a bad practice to use Cordova and Capacitor mixed? Um, I wouldn't call it bad practice. I wouldn't call it good practice either. Um, I think it's good to have only one piece of, uh, of tech uh, in, in a final product. It's okay to have them both if you plan on migrating from Cordova to Capacitor. So it's okay to have them as a temporary state mixed, if you understand, but it would be preferred and it would work better and be more performant in the end if you would have only one piece of technology. <clears throat> All right, Razvan asked me, uh, okay, I know this can be a topic for another session, but between the React Plus capacitor and the React Native, which one would you prefer in terms of developer experience? That's a really good question, Rizwan. Um, right, so React Native is specialized on React. It's made only for React. Um, in in this regard, it's exactly like going to like a restaurant that has a menu of everything, and this is this is capacitor. It, can work with any kind of flavor of JavaScript, and going to a really specialized restaurant that only serves one kind, one like one category of dishes, if you understand, like only burgers or something, and that's React Native. So I would say that React Native would be better if you plan on using React from the beginning. Uh, if you already have an app made with React and you want to migrate, you want to convert it to a mobile app, then it might be a bit trickier because React Native has a lot of things that you would have to rewrite and refactor. It has a lot of um, um, specific functions, specific components that have to be changed. So maybe Capacitor might be better in that situation if you want to do something really fast. But if you go from scratch, just React Native might be the better place, in my opinion. All right, I think that would be it for now. Uh, if you have other questions, if you you would want to follow up with uh, with different questions in uh, in the near future and you haven't thought about them today, I am available at the email address that you can find it in the slide here. And I will gladly answer uh, anybody that uh, comes forward. Again, thank you very much for attending and I hope to see you on the next one. Bye.